Good morning. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Let's lift the name of the Lord. Let's glorify him. Amen. 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 me your grace has set me free your life the air I breathe Jesus be glorified in me your love has captured me Lord sing it out your love has captured me Not anymore. Uh, go ahead, please be seated. You know, uh, welcome, especially for those of you who are online. It's a crazy time in our world, and uh, with the increase in the uh, COVID cases, we're just doing virtual worship today, except for those of us who are here to, to lead you in worship. But it's great to have you, especially uh, if you're online at home. Uh, we're going to do this for the next today and next week for sure, and then we'll kind of see how things are going. Uh, after that point. But we got a great service. Pastor Ken has an amazing message on forgiveness that you will absolutely want to listen to and digest. And then also we're going to start, we've got some great praise reports. And so uh, I'm going to ask Kyle, who is our congregational president, Kyle, if you would come on up and just use this microphone and tell us about the PPP, which people may not know what that is, but it was very important for us. Good morning, church. Trust everybody can hear me. I'll uh, take the mask off so you can hear me a little better. Uh, the PPP was a loan that was available from the government uh, to aid uh, nonprofits like churches and allow us to be able to cover payroll for our people. It also covers uh, 
interest on any loans we have outstanding as well as utilities. So uh, we were truly blessed. We received $37,000 on May 1st from the government. Wow. And this month we will have an opportunity to fill out the application to uh, have that loan completely forgiven. So in other words, we won't have to pay it back. So yeah. say a prayer of thanksgiving awesome. for that. That was money that we desperately needed at a time we needed it. Yes, yeah. amen. Thank you so much for that. That's awesome news. Praise God for that. And then Mike Lyons is going to come up. Mike uh, was in a car accident uh, several weeks ago, and uh, so he's got a praise report. Yeah, about a month ago, I was in a car collision. I was driving on the freeway. It's raining. A uh, car behind me lost control, hit the back of my truck, and sent my truck into a spin, and I wound up into the wall. During that collision, I hyperextended both thumbs, and I'd been going to the doctor, and the right thumb healed up pretty good, but the left thumb was not getting any better, and I mentioned it to Pastor Wirtz, and he says, why don't we pray for it? And I said, okay, I'm always good for prayer. We prayed for it maybe three or four minutes, and it just felt it itched a little bit, and then the pain was completely gone. It operates completely. Um, I was so astonished that it happened so quickly. I said, well, there's another thing I'd like to pray for, because for the last many years, I've had a problem with my thermostat. When it got above 75 degrees, my body would overheat. It'd get above 80 degrees, and i just have to sit down, maybe 85. If I were outside, I'd just start throwing up. I could not take high temperatures, so I said, would you pay, pray for that too? He says, well, I've never done that before, but why not? We prayed for that for a few minutes, and I didn't feel any difference, and he left, and okay, I'm going back to work, and I'm thinking, well, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I wondered, I wonder just how much much is. So I got the hedger, and I went outside at 95 degrees, and after a few hours, I'd trimmed all the hedges all the way around the admin building, and I was feeling great. And I just, I was totally astonished that I was able to go outside at 95 degrees and work for hours. Yeah, I sweated, but I did great. Amen. That's I want awesome. to, I That's praise awesome. God. I have amen. never That's in my life amen. seen something that was that fast and that awesome. Amen. Yes, amen. And what an encouragement that is because we know that our God is not dead. He, he rose from the dead and he's alive and he's poured out his spirit to lead and to guide us. And whether it's a physical healing or as uh, Pastor Ken talks today, this, this should really get us excited for hearing about forgiveness and the way that God uses uh, his spirit to help us to forgive. So uh, get ready. It's going to be a great worship. And let's have an opening prayer, and then we're going to keep on worshiping. Lord, we just praise you for these blessings. Uh, one, a financial blessing, and the other, Lord, actually a physical healing. Lord, you are still the God of miracles, and we praise you, and we trust you in all things. Now, bless our worship today as uh, we lift up your name, and may every person who's watching this be touched, whether it's now or later this week, for your glory, for our good, and the good of your world. In Jesus' name, we pray, and everyone said, amen. 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 Psalm 84 says this, verses 10, 11, and 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Oh, Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Let's trust in him and worship him. Amen. You paint the night. You count the stars and you call them by name. The skies proclaim. God, you reign. Your glory shines. You teach the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings. God, you reign. God. with 
Let the words that you say, my song remains, God, you you, Lord. We lift up your name, Father. We lift you up, Lord, and just praise you. You are our good, good Father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell you're pleased and that I, I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen Oh, and I see many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Cause you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. It 
it's a love, oh, it's a love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak a piece so Better is 
one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. One more time. Oh, better is one day in your courts. than thousands elsewhere. Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Father. We thank you for your spirit you've poured out into this place, Lord. We thank you for your, your presence right here in your courts. It is better to be here right now, right here at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, this time that we do confession and, and an announcement of forgiveness, and I like to call it uh, honest time. And so uh, I want you to be honest for a second. Did you get offended this week? Did somebody offend you? Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a child. Maybe it was a parent. Coworker. Maybe it was something that you read online, saw on, on TV. You're like, are you kidding me? You know, there's a great saying, it, it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond that matters. And that's the thing about being offended because it hurts. And, you know, I had that happen to me. Uh, it was something that I heard, saw, whatever, read. And I was just like, oh, that hurts. And then I got thinking, you know, the person that said it is hurting. And that's why they said it how they said it. And that's real life, isn't it? I mean, we, that's a daily thing. Sometimes it's hourly. And yet we're told that Jesus has made us perfect in God's eyes and that he's given us his spirit to be able to respond. And I don't know about you, but I didn't always respond so well this week. So this is why our honest time is to just take a few moments and say, you know, God, here's the, here's the ways that I failed this week. Here's the way that I sinned this week. And just be honest with him because he already knows it. He just says, give it to me because I don't want you to carry it around. So let's take a, a few seconds and just do that right now. Jesus, we come to you today, and we, we are so thankful that of the many times you were offended, Lord, you never sinned. There were times when you responded. Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Please rise for the reading of the gospel from uh, John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Now they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, 
Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and ye lead your life of sin. Now this is the God's words for our reflection. Thanks be to God. Uh, now may we confess our sin in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end and i believe in the holy spirit the lord and giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son who with the father and the son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets and i believe in the holy christian and apostolic church i acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and i look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come amen Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome. What we're going to talk about today is something that everyone is, or every one of us is going to have to deal with every day. We're going to talk about uh, the issue of forgiveness. Four weeks ago, Pastor spoke about would we pray, it's homework, pray that God would show us uh, walls in our culture that had been torn down. And then the next week, walls we may have built up or whatever, and ask God to, and only God can, tear down the walls of that we've built bricks label different kind of things like that then two weeks ago we started on the change process shock anger resentment acceptance and hope we talked last week about shock you know those things that uh, surprise you uh, and kind of wherever that comes from life does that doesn't it and that process after we talked about the change process for two weeks and it got to the uh, this word hope uh, I read the serenity prayer I mentioned that we talked, but one of the guys later on said you know you got the hope and you just kind of quit there just dropped it and I thought okay yeah but if you if you think of where we came how we came here you know the the thing right before hope was this thing called acceptance that doesn't mean you like it doesn't mean you approve of it or agree with it it simply means that you're saying okay this is what is and before that, though, was this messy thing. That's the nosebleed section up here where your anger has a name and a face on it. And that's a real difficult time for us. But before that, what kind of pushed it up is that phase of anger, the reactivity to this thing that, that has caught me by surprise. But when, when you have dealt with things, when you've cleared the landscape, when you've worked through shock, anger, resentment, acceptance, hope is automatic. 
God's grace is just there. It's, it's like he's always been waiting for us. He's saying, you know, Adam, where are you? In other words, you're going to deal with me. Because when, when you do, when you go through the process, hope is restored. That's just kind of where God wants us to come. It's that we need to learn how to navigate those times where change throws us off course. And we don't know where we are and we're angry and hurt, whatever else that may be. Or just totally swamped because it's unfamiliar to us. So hope is, re hope is restored when, when God just, he just does a work. And so today we want to talk about seven steps of forgiveness because this messy time up here often focuses on a person, individual, institution, something that, we, that we're hanging on to. And the reason, I don't like steps, one, two, three, four, five, and it almost sounds you know, mechanical, you just do this and that'll be the outcome. It, 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 but what I found over hundreds of counseling sessions with people, we need a little help sometimes just to walk things through. And so I want to lay out seven steps or seven things that I think are crucial in the process of actually letting go. Because the issue is letting go. It's not, it's not just, I think I just lost again. Something happened again. Are we still, there we go, now I'm on. Okay, what was I saying? Yes, seven steps of forgiveness. <laughs> yeah. When, when we walk through these things, uh, one of the things that we need to know in order for uh, hope to be restored is that uh, dealing with walls, we talked about that. Number one, I took a hit. Now. Meaning something happened to me that was hurtful. And there's no excuses. I don't know how many times I had people in counseling session dealing with struggles, either with spouse or kids or whatever else it may be, saying something, well, I guess I had, kind of had it coming. No, you didn't. Or maybe something like this. Well, I know they love me. That's probably the biggest one. I've heard people explain away incredibly hurtful things that they experienced growing up, and they said, well, you know, I know they love me. Okay, don't, don't, don't have an excuse because there's no good reason for a bad deed. Never, never allow yourself to justify something done to you because a bad deed's a bad deed. We just need, that's why we need to admit that there was wrong done to us. <clears throat> and if we don't get that one, then we're not going to be able to get free. So number one, we need to admit we took a hit. No excuses. Just look at it for what it is. I've, I've, anytime I deal with a couple that wants to get married, I always walk with them through, uh, actually I give them three, three questions. I say, now finish these questions. I'll never marry somebody who, I'll never treat my spouse like, and I'll never treat my kids like. Because those often uncover things where, when we we're growing up, things that hurt us, and we made a decision, okay, I'm not gonna do that. But when we do, if, if there's things like that, that that we need to deal with, we need, I, I tell couples, I'm never gonna help you blame a parent. But I'll do everything that I can to help you realize what it was like for you to grow up and how hurtful that was and how wrong it was. And therefore, let's talk now about, for, about forgiveness. So sometimes it's not even a matter of being sinned against. Sometimes things just hurt and we haven't been able to let them go. So sometimes when, when we tell people, okay, you need just to forgive. For, for, for forgiveness is a choice, yeah. But when you try to forgive and you still got something you're holding on to it, whether it's even a sin or not, when letting go is part of what we're talking about. It's part about how do you let go if it's a sin against you? How do you let go of the blame you feel towards somebody else? But sometimes it's just how do you let go? And we get kind of stuck in all this stuff and we're not able to move on. So at some point we need to take our pulse. We need, to, we need I can, I, I was awake early this morning and I was kind of in prayer and all of a sudden I realized that I was kind of, for me, my tenseness is these muscles right here. The, the, you know, what do you call those things? And I, I, I realized, okay, I'm a little bit tense here and I, I just chose to be aware of what was going on in me and, and submitted those things to the Lord and just kind of began to relax. And we, we may even need, need to learn how to physically recognize what's going on with us. Number two, <clears throat> we're going to spend most of our time this morning on this one. Because if we're going to process forgiveness, and if we're going to make it through free on the other end, we're going to have to be able to separate the deed from the doer. This is important. 
if if we don't get if we don't get this one, uh, it, not much else is going to help us because separating the deed from the doer is it, this is foundational to forgiveness. Actually, to live in life, it's not just about forgiveness. Because when we 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 need to be uh, aware of the outside triggers. Remember, we talked the other week about halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Some things set you up to react in, in, in a way. It's not that somebody's mad at you. That's just or hurtful to you. But sometimes we, we're, we need to be aware of things that, that trigger things for us. When we, uh, when we do, we need to realize that in the garden, there's no separation from, Adam and, from God, part of Adam and Eve. But after the fall... Something new kicks in. And the default setting of Adam, do you know what that is? The default setting of Adam is what we call shifting the burden. Remember what he did? First of all, he hid, covered himself, and then he did what? God said, Adam, where are you? And Adam, he didn't have to learn this. This was automatic. It's automatic with us as well. We need to learn not to do that. So he said what? The woman, he shifted the burden for the responsibility for what he did to her. That's called shifting the burden. God says, is that right, Eve? She says, well, the snake. And she did the same thing. Right out of the chute, sinful 20 seconds, they knew how to do this. It was their, we need to understand that we've got this default setting in the old man that needs to be continually brought to death and brought to death and brought to death. Or we're not going to be separating the deed from the doer. We're going to be shifting the burden outside of ourselves and focusing on somebody else who done it. They hurt me. By the way, you can be a perfect success doing that because you're always right. If somebody hurt you, well, yes, they hurt you. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you going to work this thing through and be able to forgive or are you going to continue to find fault with somebody else outside of you? Now, God says... I love the sinner, but hate the sin. Would you say this with me? God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. Now, that's, that's foundational. Let's say, for example, uh, this is Liz and I. Uh, I'll just get my other hand free here. Here's my wife, right? And she does something as distasteful to me. Okay, if I want to keep fellowship with my wife, I keep fellowship with the distasteful behavior. If I don't like the distasteful behavior and I push her away, I push her away with the behavior. So I've got to separate her, whom I love and embrace, and separate her from the deed that may cause me some pain. That's true for every one of us. And if we're not able to, if we're not able to separate that person, we'll be unable to believe this about ourselves either. If I, if I can't separate the deed from the doer, I can't believe God loves me. And I'll, I'll re struggle with this thing called condemnation. By the way, for everybody who is aware of it, guilt is a gift of God, right? The Holy Spirit says, uh-uh, that was wrong. And you say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry, okay? Condemnation is that black cloud that just kind of hovers because it becomes who you are, not what you did. And so it's imperative for us as well as others to separate the deed from the doer because God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Now, I have a little mirror in my pocket here. Okay? Now, this is a camping mirror. And when you, uh, <clears throat> if you need to signal somebody, you can do that. Okay? Okay? So I can, I can, I can signal anything I want to. I can even, let's see if I can't. Find the camera back there. Oh, yeah. Here's. If you want to use a mirror for what it's intended for, I'll tell you a story. Had a couple come to my office. They sat down. I'd been working with the man quite a while, working with the woman quite a while separately. And so Liz and I were going to counsel them together. And they came in, sat down on the couch. And uh, they both came from different directions. And one was late. I've forgotten what the deal was. But anyway, somebody said something. Somebody said something else. Pretty soon they're arguing with each other on the couch. And they stopped and kind of got their composure and apologized for arguing. I said, no, that's right, because I was really taking notes. And as soon as I got them taking the notes, I, I turned to him. I says, so-and-so, does that sound familiar? It was his family of origin stuff. Next one, just started checking them off. And then I turned to her. And I started doing the same thing. The thing she was reacting to was her family of origin issues. And I had a picture there. It was framed. It wasn't hung on the wall. Just, and I sat it between them. 
And I said, now you guys think this is a window. From this moment on, this is a mirror. Because a mirror is used right when I, this is 1 John 1, 5, right? God is light. There's no shadow of turning in him. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Okay? Now, there, there is, when, if I can't separate, if I can't separate who I am and what I did, if I can't separate somebody else and what they did, then I'm never going to be able to be clear about God's forgiveness for me as well. And I won't be able, therefore, to forgive anybody else as well. And that's why uh, in Lord's Prayer, the Lord says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he finishes his prayer. Then he says, I tell you, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive. It's not because he doesn't want to. That's why he came into the world, right? To seek and save the lost. He wants to forgive, but he knows how we're framed. He knows how we're made. And if we're unforgiving, for whatever reason, if we're unforgiving and if we don't understand that God loves me and he hates my sin and we don't sense, understand that about somebody else, that he loves them, although he hates their sin, then we're stuck. And so I need, number three, when I've gotten clear about all this, I need to be able to express whatever I feel at the deed done. At the deed done. Not, not at the person. Better hang on to that. Uh, and that's where we get tripped up. If you assess the fault, if you shift the burden, if you blame somebody else, if you're blaming, you are not forgiving. And you are likely not feeling forgiven either. It just, it just shuts things down for us. So we need to rage at the deed you need to rage at not the person. And blame does that. It rages at the person rather than what was done. And so this is a messy time. It, it's something that we're really tempted to back up from. It doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't, doesn't feel very Christian, you know, too. But that's because we haven't been taught how to separate the deed from the doer. I remember one time in my life, probably one time only, that I can say I think I experienced what it's called righteous anger. Uh, we had a man in the congregation who had, uh, who had offended, caused offense to someone else. And in the process of elders correcting him, he began to rebuke us for how we were correcting him. And this anger rose up in me about that attitude, that what he was doing. And, uh, but my righteous anger didn't last very long because I pretty quickly came to think, what a jerk. You, you see where I went? I identified his behavior with him. Okay? And, you know, he didn't receive the correction, so he left. Oh, a couple years later, I mean, several years later, three or four years later, I got a phone call. I wanted to go to lunch. I thought, ah! And I heard myself saying, I don't want to lunch with that jerk. But I did. He had come to realize what he had done and wanted to make amends and asked me to forgive him for how he had, how he had offended and how I'd refused the correction. I was so encouraged and so convicted at the same time because this idea of righteous anger, yes, it is possible and it is slippery as, <laughs> as a banana peel because that old default setting just wants to kick back in and so, at some point, I need to be able to offer both the person and the deed to the Lord. I, 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 I can't say how important that is. When, when uh, uh, I was growing up, we had the Vesper service every once in a while. I don't remember why, but there's this little exchange in there where it says, And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Well, the picture there behind that is when you come to the end of a day, you just get what, what your hands are full of, good things and bad things. You say, God, all the wonderful things you've been doing today, I give those to you. And Lord, all the things that I really fell short on or who were done to me, 
I give those to you as well. So you can go to sleep in peace. And so this idea of giving them both, the good and the bad, whatever it may be, whatever your day is accumulated on you, get free when you learn your cotton night and you want to rest for the night. The things that trouble you, the things that have angered you, the things where your anger still has a name and a face to it. Let the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. And at some point then, we need to really be able to say, I love you. And I don't mean say, I love you. Uh, I mean, practice what this means. Because this is what love means to me. God says to me, I give up the right to expect you to pay me back for what you've done to me. That's the way God loves me. God says, I love you, Ken. I came into this world to find you. I found you in your mess. I found you in your sin. And I love you. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give up the right. I'm gonna, God says, I am going to give up the right to expect you to pay me back for what you did to me. Remember when David had transgressed Bathsheba and Nathan comes and David gets it. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. All sin ultimately is against, against God, right? And so when he forgives me, he actually gives up the right. In fact, would you take your hand out? Just if you got something recent or something current where you're, somebody's hurt you, Okay, and you need to forgive them? Then let's say this together. I give up the right to expect you to pay me back for what you did to me. Learning that as a habit of life is incredibly valuable. Now, can you see also why it's so necessary to separate the deed from the doer and let them both go to the Lord and then actually spend some time where you can... And by remember, last couple weeks we talked about a safe person Raging at the deed, find a safe person to do it with. David's psalms, his pectory psalms, whoa, woe is me. He's doing that with God. I don't know who his, his companions were, if any, that he did that with. But we need safe people to express and vent how we feel about what was done, about the deed. And we don't need people who are going to gossip with us or take up an offense at the offender. That's the last thing we need. So find people who maybe know this process and can help us through with that. So this is number six. Lord, bless them like as much as you bless me. More than you bless me. Now, <laughs> how does that feel? Well, it depends on whether or not how well you've navigated this process of anger, resentment, and confronting that. Depends on whether or not you've grieved the loss. Depends on what you've been able to separate the deed from the doer. But when you come to the place where you can say, Lord, bless me, uh, bless them more than you bless me. If, if you're unable to do that, and sometimes we are, what do you do? Well, you go back to number one. Right? If, if the Lord wasn't, wasn't able to get everything flushed out and everything expressed, what does the Lord say? If you walk in light, he's in light. We have fellowship with each other. And as we do, those things sometimes keep coming up. And as they do, why does God do that? It's a good thing to practice separate the deed from the doer. Yourself from your sin, the other person from his sin, and understand that God loves the sinner, not the sin. It's a good practice. And so sometimes we're not going to make it all through in the first time round. In fact, the deeper the hurt, <laughs> the more times we may have to walk through this again. I've known a lot of people who said, man, I thought I forgave that because it came up again. Well, if somebody slapped you the second time, it's coming up again, right? So sometimes we, but what we don't, what we want to do though is listen to the Lord to get out of that loop. And that's what processing forgiveness is. But that's why it's so important that it's not, we're not just left making a decision to forgive, but that we're able to actually process the wounding. And sometimes that takes insight. Sometimes that takes uh, time. Sometimes it takes somebody else saying, hey, uh, let's talk, let's pray. It takes finding a safe person to do that with. All the things we've talked about today. So, the wise man built his house on the rock. I still have it, a picture somebody gave me, I don't remember who, some years ago. And I remember a Sunday school leaflet as a child. It pictured water 
and there's this little like sand castle down here and the waves are kind of starting to erode it away and up on this rock bluff was this beautiful house and the verse scripture verse was framed into the picture and says the wise men built this house on the rock and I remember thinking as a kid oh that was pretty smart built it up there that's kind of dumb you right there next to where it's going to get washed away anyway. You know the, the story, the, the wind and the waves blew and the house on the sand fell flat. And then I got it. What I got was the gospel says the wise men dug deep and built this house on the rock. The lots were side by side. Same lots, same sand, same storm. One stood because he had, this is hard work. In fact, it's very hard work. In fact, it's impossible work. That's why it's called the grace of God, right? This is not something we can manage on our own human strength. This is why we turn to God and we need to understand He loves me even though He hates my sin. And so, any resentment is a gold mine. I don't care how old they are, you can always revisit them. And every time a resentment comes up, then we need, God wants us to forgive. But if we haven't known how to separate the deed from the doer, it all sticks, kind of gets sticky on us and it's hard for us really to process it. So that, we, we talked last week about just the change process sometimes triggers those things. Shock, anger, resentment, acceptance, and hope. God calls us to be people of hope, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. Paul says... Therefore, we're going to exalt in our tribulation, Romans 5, no, 6, because he says tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because his love is poured into our hearts by his spirit. When we're the one who's done the wrong or when somebody else has wronged us, we need the love of God. That's what transforms us, the love of God. True love casts out fear. And this is love, not that we first loved him, but he first loved us. That's the love that carries us through this whole process of forgiving. So as we, uh, as we conclude today, I'm going to encourage you, the little mirror that I asked you to get the other day, I'm going to encourage you to just be aware that when you have a temptation, a tendency to turn that on somebody else, let the light of God's presence really shine them in the eyes, just... Turn it around, let it shine you in your eyes because God invites us to become people of freedom. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Not just peacekeepers, peacemakers. And we make peace by making peace with God and then offering that with others as well. And again, if we don't end up separating the deed from the doer, we're not going to accomplish uh, accepting God's forgiveness or giving it to anybody else. So let's pray about this. Father, I pray that what your spirit wants to teach us, that you'd soak and marinate and give birth to in our hearts, in our lives, in such a way that we can begin to walk according to what we see and what we know. I pray, Father, as you do that, you would use us as transforming agents in our culture as well. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we sing our final song of praise and blessing. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, we bless your name. Hallelujah. Here we go. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name, bless your name, and blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise, praise you, Lord, and when the darkness closes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Yeah, yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. That was awesome. So, receive the blessing of the Lord. It's His gift to you. And, and may that blessing and that spirit just carry you with that message today from God's Word and uh, on forgiveness. It's, it's to set you free. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord show His countenance upon you. And may He give you His peace all week long. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great week.